God, you are good. God, you are good. God, you are good. God, you are good. I need help. 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 So do they. So do they. So do they. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. True confession. Raise your hand if you overslept. I thought some of you didn't look familiar. But that's why we have three services, right? You slept through the one you usually go to. Here you are. Those people who are just now waking up, though, I don't know what we're going to do for them. Glad you're here. Welcome to your best 10 minutes, a series on prayer for people who struggle to pray. Seems to me that all the prayers of the Bible can be reduced down to a simple phrase. And that phrase goes like this. Say it with me. God, you are good. I need help. So do they. Thanks. We declare the goodness of God. That's adoration. Having proclaimed the goodness of God, we offer petition. We ask him for help. After we ask for help, we offer prayers of intercession. So do they. And then we make sure we offer prayers of gratitude. Thank you, Lord. So we begin now four messages under this theme of I need help, in which I'm going to encourage you to be one who asks God on a regular basis for great help. The body of Timothy Gray was found two days after Christmas 2012 under an overpass in Wyoming. There was no sign of foul play, no indication of crime or, or mischief. Gray, it seemed, was simply a victim of bad breaks and bad lucks, a homeless cowboy who died of hyperthermia on a cold winter night. Except for this curious detail. Gray, as it turns out, stood to inherit $30 million. Gray's great-grandfather was a wealthy copper miner in the Northwest. After he succeeded in establishing a copper industry, he moved to Nevada where he started a city. You might have heard of it, Las Vegas. He left his fortune to his daughter, Huguette. She died in 2011 at the age of 104. Her $300 million fortune was passed down to her children, grandchildren, nephews, and nieces of which... Timothy Gray was one. At the time of his death, the will was still tied up in probate court. But he stood to inherit $30 million. Yet he died a pauper beneath an overpass. How does this happen? Did he not know of his family history? Was he unaware of his aunt's affluence? Surely he would. Surely it occurred to him to investigate his place in the family. Sure, somebody somewhere in his life had told him the family tree of which he was a part. Surely he would have investigated. You would have, right? I would have. I would have set up a pup tin on the doorstep of my dear aunt just to stay available <laughs> in case I was needed. We'd turn over every stone. We'd read every document. We'd make it our aim to access our inheritance, wouldn't we? But do we? Let's talk about your inheritance. If you are in Christ, you are in God's family. You are an heir to God's fortune. In him we also have obtained an inheritance. 
writes the Apostle Paul. The will has been executed, the courts have been satisfied, and your spiritual account has been funded. You are not a slave of God, though that position in and of itself would be a blessing. You're not just a servant of God, though who could complain of being called God's servant? But you are a son or a daughter of God. You call him daddy. You call him Abba. You call him Papa. You sleep in his house. You eat at his table. You carry his name. And consequently, you have legal right to the family business and fortune of God. Paul said, if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed. Hmm. So you have been grafted into the family tree. You are heirs according to the promise. And you are no longer a slave, but you are a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ, through the work of Christ, when he died for you, then he brought you into the family. So if you have said yes to Christ, then you are brought into the family. And your name is written in the will. The will has been executed. And you stand and you are a recipient of the fortune of God. Does this surprise you? You ain't heard nothing yet. <laughs> in another passage, Paul goes from the amazing to the outlandish. He says, the Spirit himself bears witness that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. And we've already established that. But then he goes on to say heirs of God and what? Joint heirs with Christ. I'd be happy to be a distant cousin and pick up some of the leftover pennies. But Jesus says, you're not a distant cousin. You're not left out in the cold. You're not way down the family tree line. You are a joint heir of Christ. You share his inheritance with him. Everything has, everything he has, you have. Every resource available to Christ is available to you. Don't you look at me like that. <laughs> I'm going to say it again. Every resource available to Christ is available to you. Think about the resources at the fingertips of Jesus. Was he happy? Was he joy-filled? Was he courageous? Was he powerful? Did he speak with authority? Did he influence others? You can say yes if you want. Every resource at the fingertips of Christ is available to you. Look at the Fort Knox we call Jesus Christ. He never worried, never controlled by mood swings, never sucked into the pit of guilt and shame, never intimidated by the storm, never. You are a co-heir of Christ. Jesus cashed checks out of a boundless account. And when you gave your heart to Christ, he handed that checkbook to you. And he said, you're a co-signer on this account. John said it this way. As he is, speaking of Jesus, so are we in this world. Thank you, John, for adding that phrase in this world because we would read that sentence and say, oh yeah, that's how we will be someday in heaven. No, John says, as he is, so are we right now in this world. Right now, in this world, as he is. How is he? He is strong. He is joy-filled. He is optimistic. He is faithful. He is authoritative. How are we? Ha, ah, there's the rub. Are we joy-filled? Are we authoritative? Are we confident? 
Are we walking as he would walk? Our standing in the world, John wrote, is identical with Christ. In other words, we have become co-heirs with him. Co-heirs with him in Christ. And so we have access to everything that he has access to. And your prayers matter to God because you're an heir. When you come into the presence of God, you come not as an outsider or an interloper, but the announcement is made, one of the descendants is here. One of the children is here. And you are ushered into the presence of God because you're God's child. And you're a part of the inheritance. I have a friend who has a successful business. He's a CEO of a business that has over 500 employees scattered around the country in at least a dozen states. He listens carefully to the request of every employee, everybody who works for him. He's a good listener. But he listens especially to three of his employees. Anyone want to guess why? They are his sons. They are his sons. And he is grooming them to take over the family business. He is preparing them to take over the family business. And so their part of the work is not just receiving a salary, but it's training. It's boot camp. It's on-the-job training. They are apprentices of their father learning to run the family business. So when they come to their father with a request, he hears them and heeds them carefully because someday he's going to turn over to them the family business. Your heavenly father is training you to run the family business. What's the family business? The kingdom of God. And in the world to come, you and I, because we are His children, will reign with Him in the new kingdom. That's why last week we encouraged ourselves to pray, Come kingdom, thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Let me be kingdom-minded. Let me be kingdom-hearted. Let me have a kingdom drenching about me. Let my passion be for the kingdom. Come, kingdom. This is a father's prayer. This is our father's heart. Come, kingdom. Because he is equipping us. He is training you and me to serve with him in the next kingdom. It's not about this life. It's about the kingdom. Everything is about the kingdom. Even prayer, then. Prayer is training me to have the heart of the king. So I come to the king who happens to be my father and I come to him with my requests and I listen carefully to his responses. I take note of when he says yes. I observe when he says wait. I take special note if he says no because I'm wanting to know what's the heart of the father and the purpose of prayer is to unveil the heart of the father to bring me into communion with Him so that I'll know what He wants. Prayer unveils to me not just His gifts, but Himself. His greatest gift is Himself. And I begin to pray for His kingdom to come as a child. When my friend, who's the CEO of the company, receives his sons into his office, they come with requests. Hey, Dad, let's start a plant in Topeka. Or, Dad, let's hire a new accountant. And he works with them in finding the right answer because he doesn't just want to give them an answer. He wants to give them him, his wisdom. He wants to give them himself. The promise of Jesus is that someday we are going to reign with him. Uh, where did I get this? I'm glad you asked. Second Timothy 2.12 If we endure, we shall also reign with him. Revelation 5.10, we shall reign with him on the earth. We are a part of God's family. So what is God's family business? It's the kingdom. Jesus says, here's the reward I have for every conqueror, everyone who keeps at it, refusing to, to give up. You'll rule the nations. And so when we come to God in prayer, 
we come as his children, recipients of the inheritance, co-heirs with Christ, refusing to sleep under the overpass anymore, coming into the presence of Christ, and we're saying, okay, Lord, how can we advance the kingdom? Lord, I think I could advance this kingdom better if you'd heal my arthritis. Come. I think I could advance the kingdom more if you would give me a wife or give me grandkids. Or, oh Lord, I could use a promotion. And we listen to him to see if he says yes or if he says no or if he says wait. We listen. We don't see prayer as some type of magic butler rub the genie bottle just right and hold our mouth just right and he'll do what I... No, no, no. It's a development project in which God is unveiling his heart and he's teaching us about himself so that we in our communion, in our interaction with him can learn more and more about him so that on that great day when he says, well done, good and faithful servant, you have been faithful over a few things, I will now make you ruler over many. We'll be prepared. We'll know the heart of God. Because we have gone through the on-the-job training on earth to equip us to be ready for our eternal assignment. That's why Jesus invites us to come to him with requests. To come to him. The requests that he, we bring to him are requests that reveal the heart of God. So I close with this admonition. <laughs> Ask God. Be a great asker. Come to him with your requests daily, hourly, passionately, and listen to him. Prayer is not a strategy for your life. Prayer is the strategy of life. That's our goal, is to commune with our Heavenly Father. Remember, he is preparing for himself a people with whom he will reign forever on a replenished, restored universe. And if you said yes to Jesus, then he has said yes to you, and he has placed you as an heir of Christ. You're a citizen now of heaven. Before you're a citizen of Mexico or the United States or Canada, you're a citizen of heaven. Your citizenship has already been registered, and he's equipping you. Consequently, when you pray, you pray with authority. You pray with confidence knowing that he will hear you and that things will be different on this earth because you prayed. I'm thinking if I had have had the chance to approach Timothy Gray underneath that overpass in Wyoming, I would have said, Sir, I understand you're the recipient of a $30 million fortune. Why don't you go check it out? I'm wondering if an angel ever wants to come up to me and say, Locato, you're an heir to the joy of Jesus Christ. Why in the world are you grumpy? Or an angel might want to come up to you and say, Mr. Worrywart, you're an heir to the peace of God. At any point in your day, you can just write a check on God's peace contentment account. Why do you let yourself live in such anxiety? Or Mrs. Grief-stricken, why do you live in such sorrow when the very joy of Jesus is at your fingertips? Just ask, Jesus says. He says, ask and you will receive. It will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. There's no hesitancy in that verse. I would have loaded it with fine print. Footnotes. If you do this, blah, 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 blah. but Jesus didn't. He is unflinching in this promise. I want people to come and ask, to seek, and to knock. Ask, 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 seek, 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 knock, knock, knock. And those who ask, they're the ones who will be given unto. You do not have because you do not ask. Is this not the most astounding truth? 
You know what this means? This means that as you live in, uh, as you live out your inheritance as a child of God, you are influencing history. You're influencing the future of your children, your grandchildren. Your great, if Jesus tarries long enough, then your great grandchildren will benefit from the prayers you offer today. Time Magazine comes out with these issues. The 20 most powerful people in the world. The 100 most powerful people in the world. The 10 most powerful people in the world. And they're always people with D.C. people or hedge fund people or penthouse people, billionaire people. If heaven were to issue a magazine that said the most powerful people on earth... You know who those people would be? Might be that 80-year-old lady in the convalescent home who's losing her physical health but not her spiritual resolve. And she spends her time every day praying, praying, praying. You turn the page, you know who you might see? That truck driver who has that route between Mississippi and Texas who wouldn't take another job because he uses that job on the interstate to pray, to pray, to pray. You turn the page, you know who else you might see? That housewife who climbs out of bed 15 minutes early so she can pray over the sleeping body of her little baby. Or that husband who gets up 15 minutes earlier, stays up half an hour later, so you can walk around his front yard praying and calling the name of Jesus to come into his house. Angels to protect his children, declaring that demons have no place in his house. And he speaks with the authority of Jesus Christ. As he is, so am I in this world. So he speaks with authority. He walks in authority. Not cowardly, not timid, not mousy, not sucked into the fear of the sequestration or the falling economy or whatever it is. Because he's walking in authority. He's writing checks on his inheritance. I dare you to do this. I double dog dare you to do this. I dare you to walk in this type of authority. To believe. Why are you sleeping under the overpass? Why? I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to find one prayer request brought to Jesus when he was on this earth that he refused to answer. Flip through the Gospels mentally right now. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Surely there's some case, some story, some occasion in which Jesus had a request brought to him and he said, you know, it's a little out of my pay grade. <laughs> or I'm awfully tired today. Maybe there was a time in which he looked down that long line of people who had come for help or healing and said, Peter, cut the line off after 2,000. I just, I can't get to 3,000 people. Surely there's some case in which he said, all right, I'll feed those 5,000, but I'm not feeding 5,001. That's just one person too many. Or surely there's a case in which somebody came to him asking for healing, and he looked at them knowing every thought they'd ever had and said, are you kidding me? You don't deserve to be healed. I know what you think. I know how you live your life. Or you know what? Jesus, who knew not only current thoughts but future thoughts, could have said, I know what you're going to do after I heal you. Isn't there some case somewhere where he turns someone away? I haven't found it. Have you? I haven't found it. But I have found a story of a man whose daughter was dying and Jesus went straight to her bedside. I have found a story of a woman whose blood was coming out of her body and she reached up and touched the cloak of Christ and he stopped and he healed her before he even knew he had healed her. I have found a story of a dying thief on the cross, a man who had done nothing but live a life that society had determined he wasn't worth of living anymore and he used his final breath to say Lord remember me when you come into your kingdom and Jesus answered that prayer I have found answer after answer after answer after answer 
I have found a story about a woman. Stop me if you've already heard this. A story about a woman. <laughs> was so cast out by her society that when the city cast a party for Jesus, she was not invited, but she came anyway. Somehow she got past the servants. She crept up behind Jesus and she wept on his feet. And she poured perfume on his feet until his feet glistened in the evening sun from her tears and her perfume. The host of the party was some high muckety-muck who knew there was a time and a place for everything and this certainly wasn't the time and a place for a woman and her tears. And he was having those thoughts and Jesus read those thoughts. And Jesus didn't tell the woman to leave. He wasn't embarrassed by her presence. He wasn't concerned what other people would think. In fact, he treated her like she was the first female pope. And right in front of a man who considered himself holy and mighty, he declared her to be holy and forgiven. He said, I tell you, your sins are forgiven and your faith has saved you. Now go in peace. may be the most humble prayer you find in the New Testament. She didn't even have the words. And Jesus didn't even need them. Sometimes you don't have the words, do you? And sometimes they're not necessary. You're never without hope because you're never without a prayer. You're never without hope because you are never without a prayer. And you belong to Jesus. I believe that God hears prayers of all people, but I've got to tell you, He's especially partial to the prayers of His children. Why? Because He's preparing us. He's equipping us for our future assignment. And I want to encourage you to pray like one of His kids. Last Monday evening, I was in Nashville, Tennessee, with Jimmy Wayne. I was speaking at a banquet, and he was the entertainment. He's a country western singer, and what a story his life is. A person could hardly have a more miserable upbringing. He hardly knew his dad. His mom was in and out of prison, really in prison more than out, until he was 12 years old. When he was 12, his mom forced his sister who was 14 to marry a 25-year-old man just to have her out of his life, out of her life. And then she buddied up with a troublemaker who was in trouble with the law. And they loaded Jimmy in the back seat, and for a year they lived on the lamb, running from the law. And Jimmy spent a whole year living in the back seat of an Oldsmobile. About the time he turned 13, his mom and this fella she was running with decided they didn't want to have to put up with him anymore and they literally dumped him out in a parking lot of a bus station. He was homeless, he had no recourse, no resources. What does a 13-year-old boy who's homeless do? He would wander neighborhoods looking for work. He found himself in a North Carolina town wandering a street and he saw an older man and woman working in their garage. Turned out they had a little carpentry business little workshop in their garage and he walked across the street and asked him if they had any work and they told him they'd give him 20 bucks if he'd cut their grass and so he did he lived off that 20 bucks he came back the next week cut their grass again lived off that 20 bucks came back the next week and this went on for several weeks finally she her name is B said where do you live son and he lied and made up some address and she didn't believe him but he was lying because he was afraid he wouldn't get the work if they knew he was homeless. So she asked him again, and finally he admitted, I don't have a place to live. And she said, well, Russell and I would like you to live with us. He went back, and he grabbed this old suitcase he had, and what few belongings he had, and he brought it to their house. They walked him down the hallway and showed him his bedroom. He had never had a bedroom in his whole life. He said, I couldn't believe it. My own bed, my own bathroom. He said, I moved in, but I never unpacked my bag for four days. He said, I knew they would grow tired of me. I knew they'd throw me out. 
so I didn't unpack my bag. Finally, after four days, Russell pulled him over to the side and said, son, why don't you unpack your suitcase? And, and Jimmy said, I just... And he explained why. And Russell said, we're not going to throw you out, son. You have complete privileges here in this house. We're going to treat you like one of ours. And you know what they did? Jimmy went to middle school. He went to high school. Went to college. Now he's a country western singer. But you know what he had to do? He had to unpack his bag. I'm thinking that some of you have not unpacked your bags in the house of God. I'm thinking you're beneath the roof. You know his name. You're very grateful for the invitation, but you're not living like one of his kids. Let me tell you something. You've got refrigerator rights in God's family. You can ask for anything you want. He's written your name in the will. He's just waiting on you to ask him, to ask him, to ask him, to ask him. As he is, so are you in this world. Speak to your God. Speak with authority. Speak with hope. Speak with prayers of promise and power. Don't miss this opportunity that you have in this life to learn the heart of your Father through prayer. Enough of this living under the overpass, okay? It's time to come out and receive your inheritance. This is our prayer, Lord. Teach us what it means to be your children. Teach us what it means, this time of training that we're in right now, Lord. We want to, we want to learn to pray. We do. We don't want any, anybody to be shortchanged because we didn't ask. And, and we don't want ourselves to be shortchanged because we didn't ask. And so we, Lord, we ask you to help us to put to use every spiritual blessing that is at our disposal because we belong to you, Lord, for your glory, not for ours, for your kingdom, not our comfort, for your name. Through Jesus we pray. Amen.